Hey, hey, what's up, gardening friends? Jeff here. How's everybody doing? I hope you're doing well. I am great. Kind of a rainy, drizzly day out here, so doing things from under the umbrella, the broken umbrella. So hopefully that'll provide the protection needed to do this thing and not destroy the camera. Sitting out here with a whole bunch of lovely plants on the table, ones that I'm really excited to talk about, really common plants, ones that I do get questions about fairly often, the Diplodinias and Mandevillas. Diplodinia, Mandevillas, both of them are fantastic plants. They make great annuals. They're really good perennials where they can be perennial. I love these plants for their beautiful glossy green foliage, their abundance of flowers. These plants will flower and flower and flower. They just keep growing and they're very low fuss. They don't need an awful lot. They don't need deadheading, fertilizing should be minimal with them. The pollinators love these plants and they can be used as fillers, spillers, climbers, lots and lots and lots of versatility with how the plants can be utilized. You would think that because they're pretty easy and simple to grow that that would mean they're this should be a short video and there's not a ton to say about them. And that might be the case. I'm gonna go over the quick care for people who don't want like a long video and don't need a ton of details about the plants. They just wanna know what to do with them. I'll do the quick care shortly here and then it just go over like the differences between mandevillas, diplodinias, some tips for care and just go a little bit more in depth about some of the nuances. Propagation, leaf drop, yellowing, those sorts of things. Let's hit that quick care. For starters, Diplodinias and Mandevillas, care is gonna be pretty much identical for these two plants. We'll talk about why later. They're typically regarded as hardy zones, nine and up. Some sources will say zone 10. They don't like cold weather and frost. So if you have frost and colds, probably not gonna be a perennial for you. Maybe they will be. Go over that a little bit more in depth later. For part to full sun, they are sun lovers, but in areas with really dry air, some afternoon shade might be a good idea just to help avoid the foliage getting kind of burnt up and crispy. I feel like they're soil to say consistently moist, but if you let the top inch to two inches of soil dry out in between waterings, that's usually okay. Once these are established, if you're growing them in the ground, they can be very drought tolerant. They aren't going to be as demanding for watering if you have them in the ground versus in a pot. Gonna need to water them more if they're in a pot. Personally, I don't do a ton when it comes to fertilizing these plants. Too much nitrogen can inhibit flowering, so I just make sure that there's a good continuous choice fertilizer with them when I pot them up. And then usually I'll repeat that maybe three months later, midsummer, give them just a little bit more as the top dressing. Size is really variable with these plants. That's a hard one to talk about. Generally, the diplodinias are gonna be smaller with a more rounded habit. The mandevilla, the vines, those are going to vine up to 10 feet, if not more. Like they can vine more than that. Just depends on which type you're growing because there are a lot of different cultivars out there. These are plants that don't particularly mind being pot bound. I really only repot these plants when it gets to a point where I've noticed that when I water them, them, they're not really responding to being watered. When it's difficult to keep them hydrated, that's when it's time to repot. Or if you notice roots growing off the top and bottom of the pot, that's another good way to tell. Sap can cause skin irritation, so maybe wear gloves. The toxicity on them is considered low, but can cause problems. So keep it away from curious mouths just to be safe. There it is, fun, easy plants. That's like essentially everything you need to know about growing them. They're not too fussy. What's the difference between a mandevilla and a diplodinia. I have all of them here in front, not all, there are tons of different diplodinias and mandevillas, but I have diplodinia and mandevilla here on the table. Diplodinias tend to have more of a mounted growth habit to them, though if you put them up against something, you can train them to climb, but they're not going to climb very much. Whereas a mandevilla, like over here, see, nice big, Mandevilla, that's a vine. They are going to climb and climb and climb. They come in all different colors and leaf shapes. Like you can see this Mandevilla in the back is the more classic Mandevilla. Has much, much, much larger leaves on it and larger flowers. They don't flower quite as prolifically as the other ones that have the smaller flowers like I just showed, but their leaves are so cool. I really like both of them. This one right here, I believe is an Alice DuPont, but I'm not positive, which is just a classic form of Mandevilla that's been around for a long time. This other one, I think it just said like pink. <laughs> I, I don't know what kind it is. It's a pink Mandevilla. And then over here, I absolutely love this one that's back here. Where's its tag? I can show you the tag. That is the Sun Parasol Apricot, which is like only kind of in focus. This particular one, the flowers start off this fun peachy or apricot like color. It's a very light light pinkish orange and then they fade 
to a kind of a creamy light yellow color. I enjoy that a lot because you get multiple colors on one plant. There's no such thing as an ugly mandevilla or diplodinia. They're all beautiful plants. The mandevillas also will oftentimes have larger flowers on them, like you see back here with the Alice DuPont. That's not always as true anymore though, because there's so many cultivars that have come out that have that, like you see the flowers right here on this mandevilla are essentially identical to this diplodinia right here. See that? They're basically the same flower. The leaves are even pretty similar too. They're native to Central America and I believe parts of Northern South America. So those are the main differences. Some difference in flower size depending on the cultivar, but it's mostly mandevillas or vines, whereas diplodinias are more like little shrubs. All diplodinias are in the mandevilla family. And that's why the care on them is basically the same. There'll be some differences because well, one's a vine, and sometimes you have to take some different things into consideration with vines, like if you have them planted up against the wall, you don't want afternoon sun on them because they could get baked. They could get kind of crispy, particularly with the ones like the Amabilis types or the uh, Alice DuPont that have those really big leaves. Sometimes in the afternoon sun, that can be an issue if there's a big reflective surface nearby or right behind them. And then with the Diplodinias, sometimes their growth can end up being somewhat stringy. It'll look like it wants to vine. You can either cut that off to encourage the plant to keep staying bushy, or you can go ahead and put a support behind it and let it do a little bit of vining. But again, it's not going to be anything like on the actual mandevillas. Those are gonna vine far, far, far more aggressively than a diplodinia. Some diplodinias have been hybridized and cultivated well enough that like they hopefully won't even do that and they'll just maintain their bushy shape. These are plants that do appreciate the warmth. They like it pretty toasty. When temperatures drop below 45 degrees Fahrenheit, I try and make sure to cut back on the watering. I'm much more cautious with the amount of moisture around their roots because they're gonna be more prone to rotting if it's cool and if they're damp. Too much fertilizer, too much nitrogen can inhibit their flowering. It can also sometimes cause some discoloration on the foliage. That I'll go over a leaf drop and yellowing leaves and all that here in a moment. Less sun is also going to mean less flowers. So they can go part to full sun, but the more sun they get, the more they're going to flower. Depending on where you live, afternoon sun might be a bit much for them. So just keep an eye out. I generally prefer these get some filtered sun in the afternoon and just bright direct sun in the morning time. But my yard, there's a lot of pavement and brick and lots of reflective surfaces. So that's why sometimes I have issues with scorching. I see these planted out as annuals all over the place where I live and they get bright, bright, bright direct sun all day long and they're totally fine. So it's gonna be somewhat region specific. That's why I said, you know, just kind of have to evaluate your area. I already mentioned they don't need to be repotted very often. They kind of like to be root bound, but one thing to keep in mind with them, particularly with the mandevilla, the vine, more than the diplodinia, is to be cautious about right where that root, or not the root, right where the stem comes to the soil when you're repotting the plant. It's a good idea to keep that really well supported when you repot these, when you pull this out from its can. If there's too much disturbance in this area and in the root zone in general, they're going to be far more prone to a leaf drop, to dropping some leaves and throwing a fit when they get repotted. So it is helpful with these vines to try and disturb the roots as little as possible when repotting them. If the roots are wrapped and twisted, you know, root bound, then you might wanna go ahead and give them a little tickle and try and loosen that up and just break up that circling habit. But you don't have to go too aggressively with it. Just lightly try and loosen it up. And that's only if it's really, really like hardcore wrapped in a circle would I do that. Otherwise, I try my best to just maintain whatever root shape is there, plop it into a new pot with maybe a couple of inches of extra space on the outside diameter, refill with an all-purpose potting mix that is generally fine for them. They aren't nutrient hogs, so they do okay with that. Water them in and they're good to go. And a little bit of continuous waste fertilizer. They appreciate that too. I already talked about that. The diplodinias and mandevillas do, oh, hello camera. Both of them do propagate very easily. Stem cuttings from green growth, put some rooting hormone on it, pop it into a moist soil and they should take off. Or you can take the growth and layer it onto a, a fresh soil that maintains moisture, cut a little notch in there, maybe use a rooting hormone and bury where you made that cut and that should take root and the plant will take off from there and you can sever it and keep it going that way. That way you don't have to risk losing the cutting. It'll just keep getting some nutrient from the plant while getting rooted. Really simple to do, but a lot of these are trademarked 
and owned because they've been cultivated. Growers put a lot of hard work and time into coming up with their own varieties of Dipolidinias and Mandevillas, so it's a good idea to check the legality behind doing that if you want to propagate them, particularly for resale, right? Like, somebody else owns it, so gotta be careful there. I've never had many pest issues with Dipolidinias or Mandevillas, but they can be prone to just the common pests, aphids, white flies, uh, mealybug. I haven't heard much about scale. Comment down below and let us know what problems you've had with them, if any. I really, I haven't had any issues that I can think of as far as pests are concerned with them. Even when I've taken them in the house for the winter time, still, they generally just kept on going. The mealybugs and everything else usually stay away from them. However, I have a lot of plants, so that could just mean that I have other plants around that the mealybugs favor. So, that, so my experience there doesn't really mean anything. Like I said, comment down below so we can all learn together from that one. The main things I had to ask about with them is leaf drop or yellowing their cold hardiness and overwintering indoors. Leaf drop is a complicated one. There can be a lot of different causes for it. So I'm just going to run through all the different possibilities, the different things that could be causing them to drop their leaves. For starters, there's root rot, which would typically mean that the plant has been overwatered or just the roots have been overly disturbed that can cause leaf drop and yellowing as well. Overwatering will cause yellowing. Correct or inconsistent fertilizing and watering that can also cause yellowing and also just excessive fertilizer that can cause issues with the foliage and the flowering as well. Cold temperatures, that's another possibility. Extreme changes in temperature. If you have them indoors, they're near a draft, that could be a problem. This is really big for leaf drop and leaf yellowings. So there are a lot of different causes that could be going on there. It's a process of eliminations, figuring that one out. When growing them indoors, I make sure that these get as much sun as possible, like basically all day long. So a south, southwest facing window. I'm mean, probably keep them a foot or two away from the window, especially in winter if it's really cool and drafty. And I don't water them at all the same during winter as I do during the summer. I just give them a little drink, maybe like every 10 days or so, just let it go through the pot about once. And I let the top two to sometimes even four inches, maybe up to 50% of the soil dry out. It's one of those things where you kind of have to watch the plant. They'll get a little bit wilty and let you know when they need to be watered. And then you can kind of learn the routine and the habit of the plant and how often you'll need to water it. It'll get a little bit more leggy and kind of funky looking when you have them in the house, if you have really long winters like I do. But when I bring them back outside, give them a cut back and get them into the sun and they pop right back out and look wonderful. As far as overwintering them is concerned, oh, I'm almost out of memory. I'm gonna go through this really fast. As far as overwintering them is concerned, they don't like frost, they don't like cold temperatures, that's why they're hardy zone nine or 10 and up. But if you have really short winters, like maybe just a month or so, you can usually mulch about the first foot or so of stem coming out of the ground. And then when the heat returns, pull that back and sometimes the growth will come back out of there. I know people who have had these in zone eight, like 8B, and they've returned for them. Okay, that's it. Lovely, beautiful plants. Comment down below. What's your experience with mandevillas and diplodinias? Let us know. I love talking to everybody. Do you have favorite colors, favorite varieties? What do you use them for? I love them for the hummingbirds. I like to have them all over the place. They're just all around, just excellent plants. They're beautiful, fun, and easy to grow. All right, hope everybody's doing well, having a great day and a great life and everything's just going beautiful for you. And of course, as always, and most importantly, everybody, keep on growing. Bye-bye.